um, there is an, an option of raising your hand. If you click on participants, um, you'll see at the bottom left, you can raise your hand if you want to ask a question or um, have a comment. George, would you like all the questions to be at the end? Uh, I don't mind, I'm easy. If there's a question that's relevant to something that's on the slide, we can do it uh, at that point. Okay. Um, so with that, I'll start. Our guest speaker today is um, George uh, Gilchrist, who is VP Resources for Ivan Oman's, and he's going to be talking to us about the discovery, geology, and controls on mineralization of the Kamoa Kukula copper deposit in the DRC. George has worked in the mining industry for around 20 years and specializes in understanding the geological controls of mineralization and building these controls into geological and resource models used in exploration, mining studies, and production environments. George has worked for Arvino Mines for the last seven years across their PGE, zinc and copper projects, and was involved in the discovery, delineation, and modeling of the Kukula copper deposit. Before joining Arvino, George was with Snowden, where he worked on multi-commodity projects across a range of geological settings in areas including Southern and West Africa, North and South America, and Russia. George began his career in mining with Anglo Gold Ashanti, working on their deep level South African gold mines for five years. In addition to this, George has a keen interest in mentoring and training and was responsible for the development of the geological training program for technicians on the Witz gold mines and Bushfell platinum mines of South Africa. He continues to develop training material and focuses on mentoring for Arvino mines. George, have I missed anything? I think that's it. Oh. Probably a lot. <laughs> Keen shark supporter, um, but we can't talk sport at the moment. Okay, okay, hang on a sec there while I mute you. George, please go ahead. And everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Great, thank you. Um, it's always good to start a geology presentation with a disclaimer, but this one is, hasn't got to do with the presentation as such. Uh, I'm at home with four young kids, so if there's noise in the background, uh, just bear with me. Uh, right, so we're talking about uh, Kamoa Kukula, which has been quite a phenomenal discovery in the last uh, sort of 12 years. Uh, I want to take you through the exploration story, the discovery story. Um, I will go through the, the size of the deposit, just to give you context as to the, the scale of the discovery. And then after that, I'll go into some of the geology controls uh, and some of the detail around that. Uh, Ivano is listed in uh, Toronto, so this is just a statement on the forward-looking aspect. So the resource, um, there's metal prices in the reserve, etc. So just so that you're aware of that. Right, this is the the uh, copper belt in uh, in southern Central Africa. Uh, it's uh, uh, in Zambia. It's very well developed. Um, it's usually fairly uh, extensive, relatively undisturbed deposits. Uh, but as you come up into the DRC, you move into what's called the fold and thrust belt. And you can see those, these little dark areas are um, areas of the mine series, which is the host of the mineralization. And they become almost like little slivers. They fragments. Uh, it's a lot more complex in this area. There's been a lot of salt tectonics or halokinesis. Uh, and that's responsible in a way for a lot of the mineralization, but also causes these um, units to break up a lot. You do get some zones that are quite big, Tenkafungarumi, uh, Kowesi, <clears throat> but this is the style through the DRC. Uh, and it was thought to be the end of the, d the deposits along this line here. Uh, just, just west of Kowesi, uh, the mine series basically runs out. You cross into what's called the Western Foreland, and that was believed to be unprospective. So when Ivanhoe picked up licenses at the beginning, it picked up all around the edge of the copper belt and said, well, sure, the uh, prospective rocks are not necessarily there, but did the fluids have to stop at that point or were they still moving through these areas? And is there not perhaps another reductant that it could have picked up? That was the logic. Um, and it proved to be quite, quite, uh, quite a good logic to, to follow. So if we just zoom into the Kolwezi area, um, these little red dots are not necessarily mines, but they're occurrences, copper occurrences. And you can see that they're basically following any of the light blue, which is any of the mine series. 
So the exploration model in the DRC uh, is very much a case of you look for the mine series and then you're into the prospective areas. Uh, the mine series would normally be um, more resistant than the country rocks. So often it for, forms hills. Uh, it has, has a lot of copper in it, so it can stain green from the malachite. Uh, you can get clearings in the bush because it effectively poisons the soil, so you don't get any big trees. So the exploration model is or was fairly easy in that you're looking for hills that are outcropping that are potentially stained. Uh, you're looking for all the copper flower and a lack of plants in these clearings. So although a lot of the deposits are not mined in the early days, they were discovered decades ago. And there's only a few discoveries um, that have been made since then of deposits that are, are truly hidden and that, that weren't known about. But most of them were known about for decades. Kolwezi area has been mined for decades. It's very well known. <clears throat> Lots of open pit mines, some underground mines. Um, so a very active area. And then just west, you come across and you'll see all this green. This is the Grand Conglomerate. Um, this is the Dimectite unit. If you were doing exploration in the early days, you come across here and you go, oh, I'm too high up in the sequence. Um, there's wrong rocks, uh, let me move back again. So you'd move away from this area and you would move back into the Kolwezi district to look for the mine series. So the exploration model that had worked so well in this area actually constrained the ability to find Kamoa because it didn't fit the model. Um, so that's one of the key points here is that challenging the exploration model can be very beneficial. You know, the exploration models have helped find deposits, but they sometimes they actually work against you. Um, also, just to show this, the scale, because you're picking up, we picked up ground where no one else had it, we were able to pick up a huge area. That's Kolwezi. It's a big area, numerous mines, and the Kamo mining license is, is as big or bigger. So you've got to think of the Kamo area as a district of mines, and I think as it's evolving, we're starting to see that coming out. This is just showing some of the controls in the DRC. This is from a paper by um, David Selly. These are um, these distinct um, fault zones or lineaments that cut through. Uh, quite unusual because often they cut across each other without actually showing any displacement on each other. A lot of these seem to relate to the salt tectonics that were at play in this area. So lots of salt tectonics at work in this area. But Kamoa is actually sitting in what's called a salt marginal domain. So it benefits from the activity that the, the fluid controls that the salt imposes, but it doesn't get the structural complexity that's so common in the rest of, uh, in the, rest of the DRC. Interestingly, Kukula sits almost exactly on this uh, extension of the Monwezi fault zone. This is what it looks like. So it's a beautiful area. I love Kamoa. Uh, it's either woodland or where we've got thick sand, it becomes this uh, grassland area, but it's, it's very open, it's very untouched. Um, this is what the early exploration was coming into. There's almost no exposure of the rocks. There's a thick weathering profile, usually 20, 30 meters thick. The only place you really see the rocks is in the riverbeds. Uh, and so you get a very little small window into what's going on. And of course, when you do see them, you just seeing dimectites. So you think, okay, I'm in, I'm in the wrong sequence. So this is the strat column at, uh, in the DRC. You've got the mine series down here. That's your target. That's what you're after on the typical exploration model. And this is what it would look like. You know, you've got these green stained hills. Um, if you go past Tenkafungarumi, you still see this. Um, Kamoa, you're much higher up in the sequence. Uh, so we're up in the Grand Conglomerate, just at the base of the Grand Conglomerate, where it overlies the Moasha, which is a sandstone unit. So it's out of out of place um, stratigraphically. So what, what happened was the initial exploration, it wasn't uh, some new technology. It was just applying basic exploration principles. So soil sampling across an area, picking up some anomalous copper. So not copper that you could see visually, but enough to be an anomaly in the soil sampling. And that actually outlined the edge of domes. Um, and from that, drilling was able to go in. And I'll show you those domes in a moment. But once the domes have been defined from some early air drilling and from the soil sampling, we were able to go in and start the drilling. So the first hole came in and intersected six meters at 3% copper. So that's a fantastic start to an exploration program. 
the second hole moved about 800 meters away, eight meters at 2%, and then came back between them, five and a half meters at 2.7, and then just started taking 800 meter jumps and realized that this thing, it just keeps going. This looks more like the Zambian copper belts, or it looks more like the Polish Kupferschiefer. Uh, it's relatively undisturbed. Uh, it's continuous over kilometers. And so the first exploration discovery line uh, already started to show that this deposit has potential to be pretty big. So this is where it started. So here's the dome. This is, the, we call this the Kamoa dome. So this is where the footwall sandstone unit has come up. So there's no copper in these areas, but around the edges of this dome, we were finding the uh, anomalous soil sample copper. There's a big anticline that's coming through the middle. So it's gently dipping off on either side and getting deeper. There's the first discovery line at the top. And then drilling started to move around the dome in 2008. Uh, 2009, there was a bit of extra drilling, but it was really in two, 2010 or 2010 when the drilling started to really concentrate around the dome. And you can see some detailed drilling to understand the controls and understand the, the geometry. 2011, some significant drilling across the whole project area. So this was to really look for the extension of this and to try and zone in on the higher grade zones. So there's an area here called Consoco Central and Consoco Sud. These were found to be um, pretty high grade zones. This area here is very shallow in between the two domes and was seen as a potential open pit target. So 2012, a lot of the drilling focused on that area. 2013, uh, drilling really targeting the planned mining areas. Uh, 2013, we now have a resource of 739 million tons at 2.67% copper. So that's a significant resource. And this is, uh, so we add a few more holes in 2014. So if we look at the end of 2014, this is what we've got on the mining license. We've got those two big domes, the Kamoa Dome or what we call the Makalu Dome. <clears throat> Just have some water. Lots of drilling around these domes lots of drilling in between, and we've defined a really good zone here, Consoco Sud and a central zone, Consoco Central, and we have our first set of declines coming down to access this zone. And the, the challenge here, or the, the, one of the messages of the presentation is to say that at this point, most companies would say, you guys have done a fantastic job. You're gonna transition into more of a support role now doing sort of grade control work uh, while we get the mining going. Um, where Ivanhoe really stood out for me in this area was having done, this was nearly a thousand drill holes. We then said to management, well, there's other domes further south that we quite like the look of. Uh, we just haven't had the time to get down there. They're a bit more remote. Can we start exploring down there? Let the mining carry on. We want to keep going with our exploration. And instead of saying, no, well, look, we've spent a lot of money on exploration and we have a huge resource. I think you've done enough. They said, sure, carry on. If you've got a model, go for it, test it and see what happens. And that's what it looked like a few years later. So within just three years or four years, we defined the Kukula deposit and the Kukula West deposit. Um, and the nature of this deposit in comparison to Kamoa is phenomenal in terms of its grade. So it stands out in it's a much higher grade zone, consistent over kilometers. Uh, and it's really in terms of financials and economic impacts, it's dwarfed all of the work we did at Kamoa. So all of the focus has now shifted down to Kukula and that's where the mining's happening. So this, this area has been developed and we continue to mine here, but on a much smaller scale, whilst all the focus is down here. So the benefit of ongoing exploration has added huge value to this project. So I think that's something as I'm assuming most people on the call are geologists or geology related, um, don't give up on exploring further and motivating for further exploration. That's where we are now. So this is 2020. You can see all the drilling, the geotech drilling and drilling around here for the development. We have over 2000 holes and 600,000 meters of drilling. So Ivan and I are not scared to drill, which is fantastic as a geologist. Um, so we have a huge amount of data across the project area now. Uh, in terms of what does that mean in terms of resource? Uh, we have almost 1.4 billion tons at 2.7% copper. So you'll see Kukula and Kamoa 
are similar in scale, although Kukula has a much smaller footprint because it's the high grade that really brings it up so quickly. The grades are very similar at a 1% cutoff, but if you look at the reserve, this is at about a 3% cutoff. This is where Kukula really stands out. So 120 million tons at 5.5% copper. So that's the real, you know, you can do a 20 year mine life at 5.5% copper. So it's a really phenomenal deposit. And it's got continuity that is unbelievable. At best, I've seen the variography that comes out of here is just incredible. The, the, the ranges and the, the robustness of the variograms is amazing. So what is controlling this? Uh, that, that's something I will move into. So I wanted to do this, but just to give you the context for the scale of this deposit and also an encouragement. Um, I, you know, you hear a lot of people saying, well, you know, the big deposits have been found and it's only the difficult ones that are left. And, uh, and that's not the case. Um, you know, the Kamoa Kukula discovery has shown uh, that there are big, big deposits waiting to be discovered. So if you'll ex excuse one promotional slide, but it's just to highlight this, is that from 2008 when Kamoa wasn't uh, known to now, we've gone from zero to the fourth biggest copper deposit in the world. So these types of deposits are out there. Uh, so that should be an encouragement, I think. So let's look at some of the geology. Uh, effectively, the blue is, is, I always color the sandstone blue, and then we've got um, the green, different shades of green, that's the diamectites, and the yellows and oranges are the siltstone layers. So we have a thick sandstone package. This is the top of the Rhone group. So this is the Moasha. And then overlying that is the Grand Conglomerate, which is a thick diamectite package. This is not to scale, but this is the basal diamectite, um, which hosts the mineralization, overlain by what we call the KPS, the Kamoa pyritic siltstone. So this is a siltstone with lots of pyrite, I'll show you in a minute. And then it repeats itself further up the sequence. You can see the gentle folding on this anticline and where that breaks through, you get the domes. Otherwise you get the exposure um, available around the sides. This is uh, what the ore body looks like. It's not particularly flashy. Um, this is actually where we've got two diamond type packages. The, the first two meters are a uh, oxidized um, diamond type that's very uh, mineralized. Um, overlying this diamectite is a very silty rich diamectite. So it's basically a diamectite in this case is a debris flow that's coming into a, into a rift basin and it's picking up some silt on the way. Uh, and that silt contains a lot of pyrite, which is really important in our exploration. So the pyrite is acting, acting as a reductant um, to the copper rich fluids, which are coming up from underneath. So the copper rich fluids are passing through this first diamectite and then hitting the pyrite in this diamectite and mineralizing that diamectite. So it's not very obvious. There's some color change and you can see a little bit of the mineralization. This is higher up in the sequence. This is the Kamoa pyritic siltstone or the KPS. You can see it's just full of pyrite. Now, if we can get a fluid to see this siltstone, then we're gonna get phenomenal grade. So this is a really, really good reductant. Uh, and so the, from an exploration perspective, you're looking for siltstones that used to look like this, but have seen so much copper bearing fluid that they've now become mineralized. Um, and all of the sulfur has been converted to chalcopyrite or bornite or chalcosite. So that's the scenario at Kukula. Kukula used to look like this. It had this little siltstone at the base close to the Rhone that was full of pyrite. And the fluid hit it and triggered all the copper to, uh, to form as copper sulfides. So keep this in mind, this is a key target in the exploration. This is our footwall sandstone. So you can see it's a very nice aquifer. It's pretty coarse. You can imagine quite a lot of fluid can move through a system like this. Um, the nature of the aquifer is quite important. Uh, we have areas where we get low grades, where everything else is good. All the other factors are in place, but the aquifers become very silty. So it's actually formed an aquiclude locally and then the mineralization doesn't happen. Uh, academically, it's really interesting because you can actually see what the siltstones looked like before they were mineralized. Uh, economically, they're not obviously not the targets. So Kamoa is forming in an active, evolving rift system. Uh, you can see this is that basal diamectite. 
so this is the diamond type that sits on their own sandstone. It's very narrow up in the northeast. And as you come to the southwest, uh, the basin is deepening, thickening. Uh, this can happen in big jumps. There's a big growth fault through here. There's some other big growth faults through here and right here on the west of Kukula. So you can get big changes in stratigraphic thicknesses that reflect um, the rift sequence. So the fact that the rifting is active while all of this is forming is really important. Um, first of all, it provides the ability to form siltstones. So it forms little rift basins that allow quiet sedimentation. And during that, you can form, you get lots of framboidal pyrite, this little circular or spherical pyrite that basically grows, but it needs time. So the rift sequences can form sub-basins, like down here at Kukula, where you can get this pyrite forming. So they're really important in that sense. They're really important because the faulting that's controlling the rifting also concentrates the fluids and, and really brings those fluids up to interact with your pyrotic rich um, or pyrite rich sequences. So these are the key things. So my assumption when I was first getting involved with this was that rift systems, you know, look very simple, you know, just simple normal faults. But this isn't really the scenario. There's a rotational aspect in that when a rift system forms, the rift itself protects the basin from uh, sediment input by the nature of how these contacts rotate. So the sediment actually moves parallel to the rift until it can find some point to break in uh, and infill the rift. We don't want sediment infilling the rift because then that prevents the accumulation of pyrite. So we want a really quiet environment here where we can just get mud forming and lots of framboidal pyrite. That's ideal. So let's look at a, a modern example. So East Africa is a good place to go. So would Yemen and those kind of places. This is an area I'd love to go to, although it's called the gateway to hell because it gets so hot. Um, but uh, here's a rift sequence. Okay, this is different to Kamoa and that Kamoa is all happening sub wave base. Um, but just for illustration purposes, you can see up here at the start of the rift up here, you're getting lots of sediment coming in. So from an exploration perspective, that's bad news because it's preventing a lot of pyrite from forming. So you're flooding too much sediment in too quickly. When you come along here, you can see that along the edges of these rifts, there's actually very little sediment coming in from the side. And by the time you get into the middle, here you have an area where there's what we'd call sediment starvation. So there's no sediment coming in. You get lots of time with very little accumulation of any sediment of any sort. So that's brilliant. That's what you want. That's what you're after. Here, further along the rift, you can see that there's an area where you're getting transfer faults coming through. It's allowing sediment to come into the basin. It's flooding in and it's disturbing this nice quiet sedimentation. So the rift creates accommodation space. It effectively pushes the edges of the basin back um, and gets the debris flows further away from you. But you can get areas where it gets disrupted. This is quite a big example. At Kamoa and at Kukula, these, um, the sub-basin architecture is very subtle and you don't want big structures. The bigger the structure, the faster things happen and it's not very good. You want the very subtle structures, which makes them really hard to pick up in exploration. So here's an example of, of seeing these things at Kamoa. So these are thickness plots. And this is for the KPS, this is for Kamoa on the right and Kukula on the left. But you can see very distinct changes in thickness. Uh, and these relate to these structures that are active as the basin is evolving. And they're in variable orientations. I use these different orientations in the estimation. It works very, very well. But you can see that there's some zones where it's really thick. So you're getting some bigger sub-basins forming. Some zones where you're getting very subtle sub-basins forming. Here at Kukula, I mean, you can see the density of drilling we've got here. Look at that trend as it goes across Kukula. So there's a very, very strong control at Kukula in terms of a little sub-basin that's formed in that area. So these are the kind of things that are really prospective for us seeing these little sub-basin architectures. Of course, you only know about these once you've had the guts to go and drill in an area. So this really justifies why you need to drill a lot to be able to find these. There's a zone up here that I just want to highlight up at Kamoa in the north. Remember I said earlier, the KPS is 
probably our best reductant on the property. If we could get the fluid to see the KPS, uh, we sh would expect to see some really spectacular grades. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen because by the time the fluids move through the dimectites, it's kind of run out of steam by the time it hits the KPS. But up here in the north, we have <coughs> a fault structure that's coming across that allows the fluid to bypass the dimectite and gain direct access into the KPS. So this is like the perfect storm for us where you've, you've missed your dimectite and you get the fluid to hit the best reductance in the property. And this is what it looks like. And you can see the real effect of all these controls coming into play. So there's a fault that comes up, the fluids are moving up that fault and get direct access into the KPS. And the KPS is very sulfur rich, lots of pyrite and the grades go crazy. So you'll see here, we've got grades consistently above 10%, up to 20%, all the way up to 40% or higher. Uh, and we have numerous holes that have come out with these kind of grades in this area. And this is not a big area, it doesn't contribute a lot in terms of tonnage, but seeing the effect of the controls at play, it really highlights uh, what's happening. This is what we get, we get some really spectacular samples coming out, we get a lot of native copper, that's pretty unusual at Kamoa. Uh, solid, almost solid cuprite. Uh, and then you can see this is the KPS where all of that pyrite from the previous photograph I'd shown you is now being converted to chalcopyrite. Um, and in between, you'll also get lots of very, very fine grained chalcopyrite. So this will be running at very high grades um, across that zone. And that's the result. So it's small by Kamoa standards, one and a half million tons at 11% copper. So incredibly high copper grades but it shows the effect of being able to get the fluid to see that reductant. So in terms of controls, the distribution of the copper remains fundamentally controlled by the interplay of the hydrological controls uh, and the redox architecture. So you need a good aquifer. I mean, that should go without saying, but if you don't have a good aquifer, you can have everything else perfect, but you can't get any fluid to it, it doesn't help. Uh, Grabens, so this is the structural architecture which is forming the environment for the, the redox to, to be deposited. So you get little sub-basins that fill up with these pyritic siltstones and they become your key target. The conduits, structural conduits, they aid the fluid, fluid flow. So the graben is being formed by a faulting event, fluid is being concentrated up that event and then coming and in, interacting with your redox. Okay, so these are all of the structures you need, all the, the, the factors you need to combine. So when we're doing our exploration, we're not actually targeting the copper directly. We're targeting the structural configuration that we think gives the best chance of finding the, re, uh, the, the well-developed reductant zone. Which means that in terms of timing of mineralization, that's a big debate uh, on the copper belt, when did the copper come in? that's not as relevant to us because we're targeting the redox. So we want to find the pyrite rich siltstones. Those are our key targets. Whether the copper saw them soon afterwards or much later is relevant. As long as they're there, you've got a good chance of getting the mineralization. And this is what we get. So we've got some high grade zones down here at Kamoa. Um, I'll show you this area in a, in a moment. This is very interesting where the grade improves as your reductin gets closer to the aquifer. And then we get these very high grade, very consistent zones at, at Kukula um, controlled. You can see the control is so obvious. I mean, you, this is informed by a lot of drilling. Um, so you get these almost straight lines, you know, representing these, these uh, graben features. So this is a section across part of Kamoa. And you'll see this is the, the dimectite that's, uh, that's not a good reductant. It doesn't hold any pyrite and it's generally not mineralized. And as that pinches out, the reductant gets closer and closer to the aquifer and the grades get stronger and stronger and that bottom loaded profile gets, sorry, gets better and better developed. So this is the central area through here where you've got the reductant, in this case, the dimectite sitting directly on their own. Hello. Um, Another feature that's quite interesting that uh, I really like about Kamoa is it's got a very nicely developed profile in terms of sulfide species. So when you come down, you're in pyrite. Uh, these are copper to sulfur ratios, these lines. Uh, it jumps to chalcopyrite and then that will sit on chalcopyrite. Then it jumps to bornite 
sits on Bornite, and then it jumps to Chalcosite. And this is developed consistently across Kamoa and Kukula. That's at Kamoa where it's mainly Bornite and Chalcopyrite. At Kukula, uh, it starts on Pyrite, jumps to Chalcos Chalcopyrite, jumps to Bornite, and then it kind of drifts up to Chalcosite. By the time you're in the highest grade portion of the deposit, it's in Chalcosite. So if you're not familiar with copper species, Chalcopyrite's about one third copper and the rest is iron and sulfur. Bornite would be about 60 odd percent copper, whereas chalcosite's 80% copper. So the more chalcosite you've got, the much higher grades you're gonna encounter. Here's another example of Kukuli. You can see these beautiful profiles. Jumps up to chalcopyrite, up to bornite, drifts along to chalcosite, and then sits on the chalcosite line. So Kamoa, in contrast to most of the DRC deposits, is, is a sulfide deposit. It's not oxide. It's all um, hyper, mostly hypergene um, sulfide. Um, and this profile is actually really interesting to work with. You can see this beautiful bottom loaded profile that comes through. Uh, and the estimation, I'm not talking estimation today, but uh, we've done a lot of work to mimic this grade profile into the block model. This is what it looks like. So you start from the bottom. This is uh, Kukula. This is a very typical, you could imagine this being a pyrite rich siltstone like the KPS, except all of this that's shining back at you now is chalcosite. So this is the real high grade target um, that we're intersecting currently in the underground development. Chalcosite rich, beautifully laminated siltstone. Then above it, you get into the dimectite uh, and you get the bornite and then above that, you'll get the chalcopyrite. So when we take people there, or you know, investors or bankers, you know, they always uh, get drawn by the chalcopyrite. Uh, but of course, economically, the interest is all down here on the chalcosite. But a very pretty deposit. Uh, here's a Kukula just to show you these profiles again. So you get this siltstone at the base, and that siltstone is always consistently well mineralized, uh, and that's the target for the mining. Certainly, the first phase of mining is to take this bottom cutout on the siltstone. Um, it's a very nice target because you can be quite flexible in whether you want to mine a narrower cut, which is going to be higher grade, or if you want to open up the cut to get more tonnage uh, at lower grades. So it's very, very flexible. Um, very, very nice. You've got nice markers with the siltstone unit. But look at the grades. I mean, you're getting eight meters at 7.8%, um, 15 meters at 7.7%. Uh, so, and th this is continuous. Um, this is a section through Kukula and going off to Kukula West. So we started drilling up here in the shallowest areas and then drilling slowly moved down either side of the anticline. <clears throat> and what you'll see is uh, the consistency, 11.7 at 8%, seven meters at eight and a half, eight meters at 10, seven meters at eight, and all in that siltstone at the base. Uh, when we were looking at this core and it was coming out, you know, I'd be looking at a hole going, okay, well, where's the new hole? You know, no, 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 this is the new hole. Like, no, no, I've seen this hole already. Like, no, no, you haven't. It just looks so similar to the previous hole. Uh, and it was like that. Every hole was just, the characteristics were so continuous. And it really points to the, uh, the nature of the control. So the sub-basin architecture is what's providing this consistency in the controls. Uh, this allowed us to, to start making some big jumps. We were doing 400 meter drilling, jumped to 800 meter drilling. And then as it was getting deeper through here, by here, we're at about a thousand meters below surface. We said, well, we, we think it's getting shallower again, further west. So we jumped right across. We did three kilometer step out and hit uh, the shallower high grade mineralization again. So our models have worked brilliantly in terms of the exploration. We've been able to target high grade areas without having to drill huge numbers of holes, uh, which has been very encouraging. And uh, just to finish, I'll just show you an image of what Kukula looks like now in terms of the, the grade profiles. So this is above 7% copper. So you can see it's got a consistency that will support years of mining above 7%. This mining outline is a bit out of date. It's from January. Uh, the mining is now coming into this high grade zone. So one of my big frustrations with the lockdown is being unable to get up to site because April was going to be the month I was going to be watching the progressive revealing of the highest grade part of the deposit and instead I'm sitting at home, which is frustrating. Um, but this deposit is, is really a, a unique deposit. So thanks for the opportunity to be able to present it. Uh, these are two of the geologists at site uh, and just the start of the siltstone. So it's not very thick here, just as we were getting into it. Um, 
And just for reference, I'm just going to pop up uh, a few papers from the copper belts that uh, that I found very useful, uh, and then also some papers specifically uh, specifically dealing with Kamoa. So if any questions, I'd be happy to answer. But thanks thanks for listening in. George, thank you very much for a very well illustrated and well thought out presentation. I'm sure there'll be some questions and discussion. Um, this is obviously one of the major deposits on the planet today, and it looks like something that's pretty fantastic. So you, you can raise your hand. Uh, uh, if you have a question or a comment, unmute your mic and go ahead. We've got one. Hey, George. Thanks again for the lecture. It was a very good one and really appreciate it. It was very specific and we have seen that you really love what you're doing and the way you present it, you know it very well. And you're really pushing a lot with a very nice project. So basically, um, I've been studying in the, in the, in the DRC for the beginning and this model of the Kamua Kakula project has been just showing that everything like we were doing before was not wrong, but just show that we were not looking at the right place. And everybody was used to the mind series, the hard to as you know it very well, and now more projects and some of the projects were at being. We started just targeting, targeting the Mwasha and all the other series just to look for other deposits. And now it looks like everybody's finding new places and new all deposits in those idols. So thanks to you guys of show, for showing the whole nation, the way just to look for deposit in another way. So my question is, I've seen that you have a lot of that that you have been looking, you, you, you have recorded, but knowing that the corporate belt, especially in that part of the DLC, there is a lot of water that you deal with because you, you, you have said that you cannot find as much all deposit without just having a lot of water for that distribution as well. What do you think about it? Are you managing very well as already those data for what perspective and then money watering? As I know that you are developing into it deep, I think it's an underground mine that you're developing actually. And then this is what is quite interesting to see because there is a lot of water. Sometimes the, the more the, the hydrogeological model in the EOC can be predicted, but it can bring you up to another place where you cannot see them follow anymore. You know that so well. So, I'm very happy when I see that people start including the hydrogeological parts since the beginning of the project and likely I'm quite sure that with the amount of data that we have, how, how, how do you manage it and is it very well done or are you still facing a lot of problems like all these other mines yeah, I mean, which are underground mines and they face a lot of underground the, the One of the benefits for us is um, is that the deposit is hosted in the in the diamectite. And the diamectite is not a unit that uh, that's very porous. Um, we don't have any dolomite around us, so most of the mines um, elsewhere in the in the copper belt, when they're dealing with um, deposits in the mine series, there's a lot of carbonates around, which of course are bad news um, for water. So yeah, there's a lot of water issues elsewhere. We've got water. The sandstone is a very good aquifer, so that that's good from a mineralization pers perspective, um, but it means we have to be careful to stay away from it uh, from a mining perspective. Um, so yes, we are dealing with water, but nothing like most of the other mines in the DRC and nothing that's causing us any, uh, any issues in terms of um, stopping production or causing any flooding or anything like that. Um, so we've got plenty of water for what we need to use it for without it becoming a big problem. So that's a huge benefit. Uh, and on your first point, it's it's something that's been very exciting about the opening up a whole new area um, for exploration. Suddenly, there's been a lot of activity in in Zambia, in Angola. Um, you know, we've picked up huge land holdings in the DRC um, in these areas, and that's very exciting for uh, a country like the DRC that it's now got the this new exploration horizon that's opened up that covers a massive amount of land that's available for exploring. So it's very exciting. I think it's, 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 uh, it's really spurred a lot of exploration. Uh, Nivan, I think you've got yeah, your hand up. Uh, yeah, thanks, Craig. Uh, George, uh, I was just wondering, those basement domes that you indicated on your, on your maps, 
Um, were they identified purely through drilling or did you use some geophysics, uh, gravity or something like that to identify them? Thanks. Yeah, so, yeah, thanks. Uh, um, they were identified initially through the soil sampling campaign and then were able to pick them up on the, on the mag. You can see them on the mag. Some of the domes, like a Kakula West, they don't actually get up to surface. Um, so gravity has been useful to picking up those two. Um, we've thrown a lot of geophysics at it. I haven't gone into the geophysics because we use the geophysics very, um, uh, ex well, we use it extensively in our exploration. So I, I'm not unfortunately at liberty to speak about every um, tool that we can use because there's so much potential to find more. Uh, but the geophysics, we've done a lot uh, and it's really our primary early, early stage exploration is through the geophysics. Thanks, Rich. Uh, I think someone else had their hand up. I'm not sure, I can't find it now, but are there any other comments or queries? Last chance, you can unmute your mic and fire away. Hi, just, oh, sorry, I was trying to get my mic on. Hi, it's Camille from Itasca, Africa. I just want to say thank you so much for this. It was a very, very interesting uh, presentation. Um, and I noted right in the beginning when you referred to the boreholes that you've now incorporated into the study, you hadn't actually included hydrogeological boreholes. Um, but you've obviously backed that up saying your groundwater isn't such a big issue there, which is fantastic. Um, I've worked on some mines there, Kusanfu and, and all of that where groundwater is a huge issue. Um, I've also worked on a, another project in Botswana, on a, in the Gandhi copper box, where um, the mineralization was actually helping us identify groundwater flow because that area had no, very little good groundwater, like um, with high uh, cues. So I actually used the mineralization find then your, your aspects that we could source. So it was very interesting. So thanks so much for this uh, presentation. Cool. Yeah, my pleasure. And we, we do have, I mean, I didn't show, but we do have a lot of hydrogeological holes uh, that we've drilled across the project because we're actively developing it underground. We're busy exposing the ore body, ramping up production. Um, so all of that work has been done um, ahead, of the, ahead of the mining. Um, so there is a lot of geohydrological work, but it's not uh, as high high pressure or high priority, I suppose you could say, as something like a Sanfu where, you know, it can make and break a project. Um, for us, it's a case of managing it, knowing about it, um, but it's not really uh, interfering with the mining process. I see no more questions or queries. So with that, George, thank you very much for this presentation. It was fantastic. Uh, we will be getting it up onto the GSSA YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, so keep your eyes open for that. Safisa, do you have anything to add as president of the GSSA? Um, I'd just like to say thanks to George again uh, for that good presentation, but there uh, are no other comments. Um, I think we have one more. Joseph stuck his hand up. One more question there, Joseph. Before yes, we wrap uh, up. Yes, yeah, I have just a question, a bit of comment to uh, to George. Yeah, thank you really for a very detailed presentation. It's more structural geology, geochemistry, and I don't know what else to add. So give us a really a overall overview of the landscape. But I just have to, uh, if you go to the slide where you show the the faulting, the if you can go to the slide where you show a faulting. Uh, This one? No, now the one that you compare the reality and the one that were. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah this one. Okay. On the assumption on the reality, uh, when we look on the African geology, uh, when we look on the Katangan, you say Katangan, um, uh, the copper belt. Is the reality, this extension of reality extending up south to Zambia and Zambia, or just only unique to DRC based on your research? Yes, yeah, so the, the DRC aspect, uh, Kamoa is, is a bit unique in that it's more sort of rift style, style basin. Um, 
the rest of the DRC, a lot of um, the rifting or the extensional system is being driven by the salt. So you're getting a lot of, you had uh, extensive um, deposition of salt layers. And then as they get buried, they become mobile. Um, and as they start to die peer up, then they're creating um, accommodation space um, between between these salt um, systems. So you're getting uh, a lot of the deposits, if you, if you map um, where the deposits are relative to where all the salt is moving, you'll see that you're getting, and, and the paper that I referenced there um, from Dave Selly um, goes into a lot of detail on that, where you can show that all the units are thickening uh, on the edges of these salt diapers. So that as the salt is rising, it's creating the accommodation space around the edges. So the geometry of the um, systems is very local in its development. Uh, Kamoa is is a lot simpler because it's it's occurring over a bigger, you know, tens of kilometers scale where you can see the basin forming and deepening. Whereas most of the DRC, those changes are happening on a much more localized scale. And then that has been complicated by the later Lefillian orogeny, which has then squashed everything and added complexity to it. So um, we are really lucky at Kamoa in that we've avoided most of that complexity. Uh, whereas that's what you're seeing in the DLC. So it's quite local on the, on the each deposit will have a, a local control relative to its proximity to a, a salt um, dome or salt diaper. Okay. Uh, and also if we can go to the slide where you showed the, the Ethiopian, uh, but the Gulf, there were one slide here yeah, on this one. When you were explaining like on this, um, where it says sediment input and sediment starvation, I had to speak on the angle of as a petroleum geologist looking at it. For in geol in petroleum, when you, you have, where there's no where there's sediment starvation for us, it's not a productive environment. So opposite of mining, we need sediment to to enter in for us to have accumulation of hydrocarbon. Whereas in your side, when you say like there's no sediment in the sediment input in the mining sector is more not good, but as whereas in hydrocarbon aspects, we tend to have more sediment input because where the sediment, we have more accumulation of, uh, of hydrocarbon is more possible. So I think I really like your presentation really well detailed. I'm really appreciative of that. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's different for every style of deposit. You know, if you're in the Witz gold mines, uh, you don't want to be in a place of sediment, sediment starvation. You want to be where you're getting the coarser fans and all the coarser conglomerates are forming. Um, but in the copper belt scenario, you want to be where there's sediment starvation and you've got lots of time to form this pyrite. Um, so very specific to the copper belt style. Uh, these are the areas that you're interested in. Yeah, but yeah, so different controls depending on what you're looking for. Okay, thank you. Well, maybe, maybe we can have your email, maybe just for further communication, maybe. Yeah, sure. I didn't, I should have, I actually meant to put it on my, uh, um, on the presentation. Um, it's george.gilchrist at ivanplatz.com. Um, but I think my LinkedIn profile has also uh, been linked to this. So you're welcome to message me on LinkedIn. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you very much, George. Um, I think I'll close the meeting now. Well, no, we've got one more. Uh, sorry, Craig. So, George is Hook again from Atlasca Africa. I'm back. So, I want to just, to, following what you have discussed with Joseph and Gizzi, I want to just understand because I, was, I wasn't there at this moment when we were talking about the aborted rifting that, is, that has happened in the DRC. Can you testify that from now we can include from the fact that we have to look in other lithostratigraphical layers? Added to that, we have to go all like in the limits of the, the this rift, like the old rift which has been aborted in the DRC, in the copper belt, which might be one of the best places now to start doing all our exploration. Can you? Is the Kamoa Kakula deposit is a kind of way to show this double new way of doing exploration in the, in the DRC world. Yeah, so um, I think certainly in areas that don't contain any mine series, the question has to be asked, is the lack of mine series also representing a lack of fluid flow? If the copper bearing fluid is still moving through that system, if it can't find the mine series as a reductant, 
what is it going to find as a reductant? Uh, and from an exploration perspective, there's something to go looking for. It was what is the reductant when the mine series is not there? In terms of the controls, um, the more we've explored Kamoa and we also explore beyond the Kamoa, I just showed you the mining license. We have a lot of exploration permits beyond. Um, there's such subtle uh, complexities that come in. Uh, so in some areas, the rift faults that form in the, in the uh, Moasha align with the rifting that forms in the diamectite above. So that you would expect that if the geometries are correct to the stress orientations, it's gonna reactivate structures below it. In those cases, it's good because you get the faulting and, uh, and the basement faulting aligning. So you get the fluid flow coming up very nicely. In other parts of the area, we found that the faulting in the diamectite is different to what's in the basement. And in those cases, you're getting fluid flow that's coming up where those two faults intersect, you get really good grades, but away from that, you don't. So you get very spotty grade. So you're not getting the correct alignment of structures. So there's complexities in the aquifer, there's complexities in the basin. Um, one of our consultants says that he has the Goldilocks model for us. Um, faulting that's too little doesn't do enough to create reductant traps. Um, faulting that's too much does too much and creates too much activity and too much sedimentation. So we're just looking for the, the one in between, not too much, not too little, just right. Um, so there's a lot of complexity, but it's certainly um, uh, the type of targets or the type of model that you want to take into, um, into a rifting sequence away from the mine series. Okay, one more comment and then we'll close it. We've got one gentleman with his hand up. I'm unmuting you. Oh, uh, Craig, I think that is the same gentleman. So oh, um, okay. I, I think we, yeah. So just what, before we wrap up, thanks again to George and thanks for our first sold out uh, lecture. So thank you very much for, for providing that. Uh, you're a rock star, like I told you earlier. And sure. I think with that, Craig, we can uh, close the lecture. Thanks everyone for joining. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.